Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. It was a very insightful presentation of the paper. Uh, we read uh, the working papers, so I don't know if there might be like some differences from what like the published, the already published paper. Uh, but yeah, we were working with that. So, as a matter of fact, we saw that the internal labor market and like updating the definition was bringing it like into like this century in a way it was like the main goal or like in a way um, of the paper so that is what we have built on the presentation and also how can sorry Ah, okay, okay. So, uh, and also we, like on the on the paper, uh, we lack a little bit of information about ILMs because uh, we were discussing between each other and we, like none of it, us with different backgrounds knew uh, what ILMs actually were, <laughs> which is interesting. This should not be the case because they are very useful. Now we are looking at them. So yeah, this is the content. The ILM's background theory and definitions, a brief summary of the paper because you've already like mentioned it, uh, strengths, weaknesses, and the contributions, and the discussion on validity on ILM's in the current globalized context. Uh, within consideration, uh, with, within country considerations and across country considerations. Uh, so it was, uh, so it's a concept developed in the 50s, but also more implemented, like more used in the 70s, uh, where some authors uh, were not actually satisfied with the supply and demand models of that would only explain external labor markets rather than internal. So what is it, this, what are the external labor markets? It's where, it's where move workers move somewhat fluidly between firms and wages are determined by the market. Uh, determined by some aggregated processes where firms do not have significant discretion over wage setting. Whereas internal labor markets, workers are, are, are hired into entry level jobs and, ha and higher levels are filled within the, the firm structure. That, like, this is like the main differences. And the wages, as you already mentioned it, are somehow not determined from the market structure, but more like within the, mar the firm structure. So why are they existing? What is the meaning of this? Because of a scarcity of skilled labor. And how? Internal, uh, internal on the job training efforts. The consequences, the consequences of this is that because workers and firms would incur into some costs investments, the job mobility will be within the firm. I hope this will make it more clear. And like you already talked about uh, like labor segment segmentation, we have like a primary market, employees, uh, job with high wages, job security, promotions, and secondary markets. This, this is important because not all the employees that are within a firm are considering uh, ILMs only like with high wages, job security, promotion, promotions, etc. So, but why would a firm would aim to have uh, ILMs? Because this would give them an advantage at adjusting rapidly uh, to external shocks. Um, and this would like mean a more stable growth. On the summary. Uh, thanks, Julio. And I will continue to talk about your working paper, um, Internal Labour Markets in Britain and France. And we'll keep it very short since you've presented everything already. That's not always the case with every presentation, so we didn't know. Um, but yeah, keep it very short. Yeah, you covered everything already. Ex it examines the existence and relevance and characteristics of LM firms and LM firms in Britain. And uh, yeah, we found particularly the two data sets uh, uh, particularly impressive. Um, yeah, and we um, 
it explicitly explores um, how these firms um, and how these ILM characteristics correspond to various factors discussed in the literature, so, such as employee demographics, payment schemes, and um, and sorry, yeah, please next slide. And innovation strategies. And again, the key findings, just very short. ILMs are more prevalent in France than Britain. Um, and while they share some key characteristics, uh, such as em employing mainly qualified middle-aged men and being large and older than the average workplace, and they also have distinctive characteristics. Um, so French ILM firms, you said it already, um, are, use more performance-related pay and are more innovative in comparison to their British counterparts. So come, yeah, thanks. Um, so coming to some contribution from our side, um, so we want to briefly mention that we came, uh, we had to read uh, the working paper, so which was not different from the from the presentation, but the presentation made a lot uh, way more clear. Um, yeah, uh, so we particularly liked about it um, how you re recognize the importance of institutions. You mentioned those numerous times also within the presentation, and also the national differences and. Yeah, in that context, um, we found the approach towards a cross-country comparison particularly convincing. Also, you said like the very specifics of these countries are very interesting and something that cannot be observed like with a pool data, data, um, data set for, like from the EU, whole EU, so to say, for example. So we really liked that that it delved um, into the details of each country. And uh, concerning the quantitative part, it's very well explained. This was again the case for the presentation as well. And for example, also in the paper, you explained why you use all S, and despite of certain variables being on an ordinal level scale, um, or how uh, a variable might be coded differently in the other data set. And yeah, it's not, not about the technical stuff, but it's um, we think it's about how you approach an econometric analysis in research. But even more, and that's a very strong point we wanted to make, how you report on it on our paper. Um, so for us readers, it was like very easy to follow all the time, and that's not necessarily the case for other econometric papers where you actually at some point don't know how you got there. So this never happened to us, and we really liked it. Yeah be it for winterization or gathering missing data from third databases, it was always very clear. Yeah, and the same was true, not only for the data work, uh, but also for the analysis as such. Um, yeah, we were very impressed by the detail, detail and it was particularly understandable and trackable, so uh, thanks a lot. Um, but we also, uh, thanks, uh, want to highlight some criticism to engage in a discussion. A bit of it is a bit embarrassing because much is like way more clear by now after the presentation, but still, I'll still present the one we have prepared. And that also mainly relates to the working paper. Um, so our criticism mainly stems from two points, the first being the theoretical framework, and we argue that it could be more tightly integrated in the quantitative analysis. Um, we found the theoretical framework to lack a, lack a bit of depth, but now we also know it's just our lacking knowledge um, of the theory. Um, yeah, and also because it's uh, more of a quantitative work and not a theoretical, admittedly. Um, also maybe because it was a working paper or maybe all of it together. Um, so yeah, and we also thought in the very end it was not explicitly clear what these um, results imply for the theory of ILMs, although that improved again with the presentation a lot. Um, yeah, it's not to say that it's not connected, but it could f profit from a th tighter theoretical integration, we thought. so. Um, now, again, we understand it way better with the presentation, but in the paper we were not um, clear. We had an idea why you chose those variables, and you explain how they um, represent a close relationship between employers and employees. Um, but again, in the uh, in the working paper, we we wish we would have liked to have a more detailed discussion why those exactly how those how those relate to each other, and the possible pitfalls of them. So um, yeah, we would have liked to, to see. But yeah, again, this is also more clear now. And similarly, we believe that the results have, could have been more tightly integrated into existing research, but you also made that clear, especially with your outlook by the end of the presentation, that helped a lot. Um, yeah, for example, you mentioned the importance of institutions also in your presentation and in the working paper, but in the per working paper, it's lacking a bit in that we wished for 
a bit more depth because we found the approach quite interesting, like comparing difficult um, difficult political systems. Uh, but yeah, it would have been nice to have a bit of an analysis how these uh, like influence the ILMs particularly and not like just highlight that it's different systems and that those, um, but yeah, how might they actually correspond uh, and how might they have an impact um, for ILMs? And um, yeah, and generally speaking, it might also relate to like the policy or broader implication we can draw from that. And um, yeah, but overall, we enjoyed really, really enjoyed reading it and and um, the presentation also helped a lot. Thank you very much. Okay, um, to move to the discussion a bit, I we thought we would uh, develop a bit more in discussing the relevance and the scope of uh, <laughs> of ILMs in the current context. And for starters, we can talk about both regulation and representation. So as we've discussed previously, the ability to distinguish ILMs from external labour market forces has uh, been a bit blurred as firms have changed in their characterization. Um, and this is usually due to market-based reforms to the labour processes. And this is also a sort of ideological point that, um, particularly from the 80s onwards, that often high employment protection, particularly in England, uh, was seen as something harmful for employment levels and the move to this more market-oriented approach has been responsible for an increase in job precarity. And then alongside this you have the increased use of uh, non-standard working practices and this relates to ILMs because employers can in a way remove some occupations uh, from the wage setting norms of the ILM system and provide these workers with uh, less training or lower wages or less security. If you're thinking about maybe in the manufacturing industries, the contracting out of work from the, from the central uh, firm to uh, specialized firms outside of the ILM model. And this really has an bit gives the ability to firms to restrict who within their firms benefits from the uh, from the internal labour market. And the second point I would like to make is um, to put it in the context of structural change and technological change. So I've taken a graph looking at um, manufacturing share of employment in Europe. So uh, you see the UK is the blue line with the, with the square box and it goes from being um, the highest share of manufacturing employment in the 70s, which was when ILM was created, uh, to almost the lowest share by the big beginning of the century. Um, and obviously France sees a, a similar path of deindustrialization, but perhaps not to the same, uh, same extent as Britain. And this is important because, um, as mentioned before, the theoretical framing of, of the theory originally was mainly around uh, the manufacturing plant and around the manufacturing firm. And perhaps this is alluded to in the paper with the sort of loss of momentum for this concept, perhaps as um, the original case has, has, has fallen away from the, extra, uh, from the economic structure. But I also want to link this to um, broader technological change and uh, and digitalization. So we've seen that more recent technological change has broadly been skills biased. So it has uh, benefited the higher paid workers over the lower paid workers and has really re reinforced this duality. And also in terms of the relevance uh, of the ILM to the firm processes, uh, with technology, um, digitalization has, has allowed the um, has allowed the, co the codification of uh, firm practices and of firm knowledge. So the relevance of firm specific knowledge of employees, uh, be it experience or knowledge from previous projects is perhaps reduced because firms are more able to codify this knowledge and pass it on to other employees. So from the 80s onwards, we have seen uh, like neoliberal policies of flexibilization of labor market 
and globalization and like from a structuralist point of view like we see that there are like some specific countries uh, we we can call them in this structuralist approach core countries that have specialized on like uh, like yeah, like capital sector, capital sectors where like periphery countries are have been specialized on manufacturing and uh, extractivism so just as uh, looking like as reading at the paper we were like thinking about which countries at what firms in a global context in a globalized context could be those ones who are uh, utilizing ILMs and empir empirically, we thought that might be the multinationals because they are like the the, the biggest and uh, the ones who can bring the better benefits. But also, like there is, there are like other um, conceptualizations of ILMs that it's not only within within the firm uh, labor market, but in the same specific sector. Uh, so just like keeping that in mind we were trying to build up build upon the context of ilm and like trying to update it so like using this map uh, we can see that the like most of the multinationals uh, like are localized in just very specific countries this is not new of course but then i i was working on my bachelor's thesis on um, like uh, research questions of high skill Mexican migrants and their labor insertion in the USA, and while I was reading your paper, it like made up so much like match with my bachelor with my bachelor's thesis, which I didn't know ILM's uh, like existence by that regard. So like the hypothesis that I had in this in this case was that studying in the USA would actually be statistically beneficial to, to have a, a labor uh, incorporation, like an incorporation in the labor market more easily. And what I found is that actually it's not like studying itself, it's more about the field of study, but in fact, it's more relevant to, high, uh, to have a job from Mexico, like from Mexico and from Mexico, you move like that, you move to the USA. Then I was like, this is like, like, this is not what I was expecting to find. And I was like, okay, who are these people? And these people are male supervisors, prior migration, middle class with no family members already in the USA. This is very relevant for the Mexican USA came, case migration because most of uh, the migration it, it's like it moves with because there are already links in the USA and this this means that there are already no links in the USA and they have studied and they have studied economic manage in the man economic management field so it seems that uh, there is a, like w we are looking into um, migration intra firm mobility this was a survey uh, from like 425 uh, observations we didn't answer or the survey didn't uh, ask about the like about the firm like about the intra firm mobility so it was just like a theory that like an uh, hypothesis uh, after the the work but it was very interesting because could this imply uh, my work would this imply that actually like multinational firms would uh, train uh, train their employ their employers where they have like which is m much more cheaper for then move them where they gain the more profit and benefit from and this is an answer that I, this is this is just a, an open question that I had for my bachelor thesis and this can be answered with ILM. Uh, so it's how ILMs can be relevant in this globalized uh, financial context. So for questions of this for discussion, Owen, well, because okay. he, he's the name. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I th we, so we just had a few questions. I, I'm sure you can react to some of the the rest of the presentation. Um, 
from from my from my side i my main question is the first one if we if we accept that ilms are weaker um and these these firms are in stable or declining markets ha and and also that there's the um the the maybe the move towards the occupational labor markets how do we promote stable careers for those that want them the sort of job for life um discourse that uh, exists and also do we see a decrease in the value of, of firm specific knowledge and does this also impact um, the existence of ILMs and then also we'd like to know a bit more about the institutional differences and how these might shape ILMs that was something that's mentioned in the paper and then overall do we think ILMs are desirable and are something that should be targeted and with that, I want to thank you again, and thanks everyone for listening. Would you like to react there, or you want to come on the stage? Okay. Yeah. So, the, yeah. So now you are you have to answer these yeah, questions. Yeah, I can keep this slide yeah, and the later because I don't know it no more. Yeah. I mean, after after you complete them, you will have people asking a couple of questions from the yeah I think I had the micro here so yeah. thank you um, so I'll, I'll actually go back to these questions but maybe say one or two words on the on the first discussion points that came uh, <coughs> so I have to choose which is good news. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Thank you for your uh, thoughtful reading and very <coughs> um, complete. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, maybe one general point is, well, it's a bit about the publishing process in research. A part of the answer is there. As you pointed, what you had is a, is a working per paper version. But uh, the other point is it's not published yet because you know about the review process is like six months every back and forth so it's a long-term process but what's interesting and maybe a bit depressing from the point you had and the way I presented it which is in close to this original version I'm not sure I wanted to add unfortunately but maybe it's for the sake of it once you once you're at the end of the pr publication process you see the good part of it for now i see only the frustrating part of it which is i think we're going to have to split part of the discussion from segmentation to the empirical results because well uh the thing is you you know you have these review process and the reviewers they are either specialists of the segmentation or of the empirical analysis and it's very difficult to get them agree on the choices we made on these both lines and basically uh, people who do econometric analysis of this type wouldn't understand the segmentation literature in the way we've put it which is the more institutionalist way of seeing in general labor market and segmentation and which is not the most common way of seeing that so it's it's big it's getting a bit difficult to convince on these two levels at the same time so maybe the question about segmentation will be developed separately and here we'll focus on the empirical results in the next version of the paper yep yeah i also felt like when reading it like if you really did a deep dive into the theory and add this competitive analysis it would like not much take on it yeah that's it it would it would be very long and because it's not the usual way of seeing the theory is difficult to get it through in, in, in a reduced version. And because basically here I'm presenting it the way I see it, but still, I don't know, like 90% of labor economists, if you say, if you talk to them about ILM, they would think about the 1970s and getting them having an interchangeable version, a dynamic definition of ILM is in itself very, uh, a lot of work to convince them so maybe it was too ambitious in having the two together uh, so maybe it won't be developed in the next version but uh, <laughs> actually totally the opposite but may come out in some other publication at some point so that, that was really about the just to well give you an idea about these type of process and how they go on but <coughs> more on the um, 
Um, well, maybe I would reflect on, on, on uh, yeah, uh, uh, maybe a, a bit of a general reflection on the change on um, market-based reforms. Well, I, I would also have a quite an institutionalist uh, response to that in the sense that I would argue the market orientation is mainly something that, well, diffused at very different levels in the economy since the 1980s. Okay, so this market-based way of thinking things diffused in, in um, employment policies, but also in HR policies. And the traduction or the, the, the translation of this diffusion in HR policies and in ILMs would be the idea that we went from careers that were guaranteed like you would come in a firm and you would know basically what, what, what would be the path, okay? And if you did everything as accepted, you would go through this path. There was some sort of guarantee collectively acquired by union, etc. And then we would go to a career opportunity. The term I use here is opportunity, meaning there are options that are open, but there are various options. And the way they build is quite of uh, decentralized. Okay, and this is what I would call the market philosophy in the sense of it's decentralized inside. It's, it's less centralized than before the way career builds. It would be more decentralized with some mechanism that would mimic the market, like performance pay, like um, work organization, uh, more on the team. It would decentralize at every level. Okay, and so this would be the way I would interpret the market based diffusion. In, in this uh, context of ILM. So they would definitely change and be uh, changed by these change in nature of institution and values. But then some basic characteristic would stay the same, the one I pointed. But inside, the real life they, they <laughs> would be very different because of this philosophy that would be different. Um, another point I don't have time to go into is about uh, internal duality. You pointed I <coughs> can't, can't remember which of the three of you uh, pointed at uh, the role for non-standard work. I didn't go through that notably because we don't have empirics about that, but it's the whole part of the literature on segmentation and mainly the one that is mo most common today in the literature, in economic literature, is talking about segmentation, strictly speaking about short-term contracts. And as you saw, I'm not in line with this version of segmentation because I think segmentation is between firms and not between types of contracts. But I still would say that it also exists between type of contracts, okay? But it's secondary in labor market level. I would set it as secondary, but of course it also happens. And, of co and especially in France, since the 70s, it has been pointed that the specificity of ILMs in France would be to have this second tier of non-standard work who, to, which, to whom you wouldn't give any of the advantages you're giving to the heart, the core workers. Okay, so this duality is also integrated in that scheme. Um, and maybe as a last remark and regarding your, your <laughs> development, um, I think it nicely points to the role of ports of entry. There's a whole literature on where do you get in this internal labor market, and the literature coins these entry positions as ports of entry, and so <coughs> and it's it's uh, the, the the historical literature will point notably at the homogamy of the recruitment process, and there's a whole uh, understanding of uh, of um, discrimination also because. Uh, um, Doringer and Puri would describe how employer, well, working together inside an ILM is a lot about sharing values, okay? And the point they would make is the best way to be sure the people you're recruiting will share the value of the people that are inside is employ someone that has the same characteristic as the one inside. I'm making a long story short here. But this is, for me, the way I would interpret your results saying, if, even if you have a high qualification and you're Mexican origin, 
you wouldn't have access to this port of entry because of these barriers, of the discriminating barriers. But once you enter through the Mexican part of this multinational, there you would have, in the Mexican setting, you would be in the good side of the market because you would be highly qualified young men or uh, whatever. The, the, and there you would be on the good part of the segmentation. And this is why you should go through this door and then move inside. Because if you're in the US labor market, then you're not in the good part. You're, you're a foreigner, whatever training you had and you're young, etc. So it's, uh, for me, it's all about ports of entry, maybe that you could have it as an interpretation. Um, yeah, uh, if we come back to these questions, well, part of the response here, I think, connect that. Um, well, yeah, because so for institutional cross-country specificity, of course, there is a lot to do with institutions and public policies in shaping these ILMs. And <coughs> I think notably for the role for um, the role for uh, um, merit pay uh, and, and all the payment schemes that are specific to France. I think there's a really nice paper by David Marsden uh, comparing France and Britain uh, on this point and showing how it's due to public policy that tend to motivate this kind of remuneration because of tax exemption but also to the existence of networks of employers that tend to share good practices and that are very intense in France. And he nicely shows how different level of institutional setting combined in fueling the development of some HR practices in some institutions. So maybe I would point to that literature on this kind of questions, but it definitely has something to do uh, with the point here. Yeah, let's open the question now. Hi, uh, my name is Max and I'm from Germany. Uh, first of all, I have to say I enjoyed uh, your your analysis and um, the uh, results you presented. Um, but I really, really, really have a problem with the concept of internal labor market because it is, it is not a labor market. There's no supply and demand working. Why do you not use the concept of organization? Because you see it's confusing. And organizational principle of rewards clash with market principles of reward. They're not the same thing. So why do you use it? Well, it's let's been say <laughs> if I was in 1970, just before Doringer and Puri, I may have the choice. But now, let's say there are 40 years of building on this literature. And <coughs> Actually, if you remind, it's maybe the first point I made in this conference, that the term market was inappropriate for this concept because it's, it's coined by the fact that it's separate from the market. So I totally agree with your point, but now we're 40 years after this literature has developed. So unfortunately, we don't want to just throw it all the way. <laughs> I mean, we need, there are some people for whom this concept has a real sense and, and some people who know about it, some don't, of course, but it's normal. And, and for those who know, we, we, it's, it is still useful to use this term that is well known. But I understand your point totally. And and just one thing, like uh, I think uh, my hypothesis, like uh, just uh, on the econometric analysis, would be that if you'd have a variable that would code um, like position the hierarchy, like the, the the hierarchical position within the organization, you'd find also very high correlation with wages. That would be very interesting to look at. Like rather than tenure taken hierarchy, that would be very interesting. Yeah, but then you, you should remember that the point was only controlling for what the worker brought with himself to the firm, okay? We wanted to see, I mean, the position in the hierarchy is already something the firm obviously has an impact on. So it's already part of the HR strategy of the firm. So this is why I don't want to control for that when I want to spot what is the specificity of firm. I want to, I want this dimension to stay in the fixed effect because I want this fixed effect to estimate the impact the firm has overall on tenure and on wage. See what I mean? So, <coughs> but obviously it will has an impact. It will have an impact, but I want it to stay in the fixed effect and not separate it from the rest. Okay. How much time do we have? Three, four minutes. Three, four. Maybe two questions. Minus three, four minutes. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, so, uh, I found this presentation, uh, well, first of all, I am a uh, Celso, I'm Portuguese. I found this presentation tremendously interesting. Um, there's just one, one detail that I, that left me um, thinking I'd like to know the, um, if something could be done regarding it, which is the way how you identify ILMs, which is the Venn diagram of, you, of using the um, a median, if uh, the mm -hmm. companies are above the median and the, and the way they intersect. And, um, and the, when you're referring to the case of, um, of um, the UK, I think it, uh, the amount of the intersection would be 16%, 16.2, something, something amongst those lines. And you refer to it as being still quite, um, quite um, a, considerable, a considerable size of them. But when we're thinking about um, the medians, well, half of the companies in both sides are going to be uh, not half, but something close to it. Or something close to it will be above the um, will be above the median. So, uh, could we consider 16.2 percent as being that significant? Uh, as, as being that significant, because the zero percent or something very low would have to imply that there's just two big blocks of mm. companies in the economy: those that uh, people stay forever and pay terribly, and those with very high uh, turnover. There are nicely paid what would be <coughs> uh, a neutral position for us to compare those 16 the 16 percent and the 39 40 in in, in france um yeah so yeah it's all about the how full and how empty glass you know like <laughs> you could obviously say it's really low if you're if you're <coughs> joining the two more than median uh, so it's quite disconnected, but then it's so disconnected. I mean, the usual discourse about Britain would be there's no way for internal career, that something is out of the picture. If you would talk about Britain and look about Britain HR practices, this idea that people, there are places where people have uh, space for internal career and where some firm invests in that would be totally out of the picture in public debate in labor economics in the Britain. So from this point of view, it's a lot, <laughs> okay? But on a mathematical point, I totally agree that obviously it would be such an exception to have these two so disconnected, but then exception <laughs> exists <laughs> in real life. So, and, and also because, I mean, it's really something it could be. I mean, it, it is not so uh, weird to think of a total disconnection. I mean, it quite is in line with what people, a lot of people, I suspect, would expect talking about the British labor market, really. Any last question? Uh, a last question. <laughs> I have a last answer, <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> sorry. But it's not going to last long, sorry. But. I'm just thinking about uh, one of these about firm specific knowledge because this is actually, um, it was very important in the segmentation debate. So just to point that there's a whole point on that, notably because Doringer and Puri, well, basically Puri, his whole work after the 71 book was about why do some firms put in place ILMs? And his argument was about firm specific qualification. And he really developed, it was first about stable, uh, level of qualification and then the, its specificity and then stability of demand and he kind of built on this thread of argument for two decades and it came to the late 80s where there was no more firm specific qualification and stable demand and kind of he kind of um, you know it's, I'm all in expressions today but he kind of uh, uh, cut the branch he was sitting on at some point because we, <laughs> talking about all this story about specific qualification and in the end when the economic functioning changed basically totally in the 1980s well he wouldn't have any argument about the existence of ILMs anymore because there was no more such intense highly firm specific capital investment and then to my argument this is why he didn't work on that anymore from this point, more or less, that and other arguments. But anyway, 
<coughs> so when I did my PhD pretty much at that time, my whole point was about finding what would be the building argument about uh, internal labor market that weren't these ones. Because I would see that internal labor market would continue to exist, but that this argument was not one that could continue to exist. So I would argue this is not the crucial point into the existence of INMs, the firm-specific qualification. But that's a whole theoretical discussion. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs>